Hey everybody and welcome to the Baby Bunting Live Series. Now this is episode 7 and we're here to discuss sleeping and sleep routines for your little ones. I'm Elise and tonight I've got with me Deb from the Nai Nai Baby Sleep School and so I've got a few questions to be asking her tonight but I'd like to start off with Deb. How did you get to get into Nai Nai Baby Sleep School? You know Elise that is a great question and I completely fell into this because I had my two babies in the 80s and I was done with being a mum anymore and then I got to that magic age of 40 and decided I needed another baby and that turned out to be my problem sleeper. So I, uh, I thought how am I going to get my baby to sleep? He was a catnapper and maybe you've got catnapping babies out there, they're in your arms all day and then they're in your arms all night and you've tried lots of things and it's really tough and it's especially tough now that you're confined to home and you haven't really got any support. And, you know, I really wanted to sing to my baby, but I couldn't find anything that I wanted to sing. I didn't like any of the, the lullabies. And then I love classical music and I didn't like any of those. So I ended up devising something myself and magic. It was really magic, it worked. And then I thought, well, let's try this out with other babies and it worked for them. So seven years on, I, um, I have a, a nursing background. So I was used to uh, looking at research and having evidence-based um, resources and when I uh, discovered exactly what I was doing and why it was working I found that there was a huge amount of research and here I am today helping other families resolve sleep issues. Well thank you so much for coming down tonight to be with us and we hope that we'll be able to provide every one of our audience a little bit of magic to help their child go to sleep. You know that's what we really want to do. Mm. We're here to support, we're here to give that guidance and you know, throughout this session, if you've got questions and you need that little bit of magic sprinkled out there to your little one, jump on into our comments for that live um, Facebook feed there and pop them in the questions so that we can answer them at the end of this session for you. So I'd Fantastic. like to see what should parents expect when they take that newborn one home with them? Well, you know, your baby doesn't come with a manual and boy, we really wish they did sometimes. But every baby's different and generally you find you've got the baby that's the sleepy baby that feeds and sleeps and people will say, you know, that's a good baby. I think they're all good. Or the baby that um, won't settle, cries a lot, feeds poorly and you have that cycle of they haven't had enough food so they cry and then they can't sleep. They've got a belly full of pain, full of wind. And, you know, every baby changes, even if you've got that perfectly good baby at the start, often a few weeks or months down the track, things change. So uh, be prepared. And that's it. It's be prepared. Ask for that help if you need that help. You know, there are people out there to ask. Most for. definitely don't refuse any help, even if people are doing things differently the way you do them. I remember my... Um, a friend came and folded towels for me and she wasn't doing it the way I was doing it. And I was like, oh, I'd rather be doing this myself. But you know, that's a lesson for you. Let people help you. So I guess when we first come home from the hospital, what's the environment that we should set up in the nursery? What are those key items that we need to bring bubs home? Well, you know, firstly, Elise, you need a safe sleep space for your baby. There's, um, there's it's never, don't ever take a risk with where your baby sleeps. So ensure that you've got a very well um, made up cot that has all the safety standards. If you're using a bassinet, the same thing. Babies need to sleep in spaces with lots of airflow because um, when you restrict airflow, there's potential for a, a SIDS event to happen and you really don't want that to happen. So make sure that your, your cot, we'll show the cot here, the mattress is very well fitting right up to the sides. There's plenty of airflow around the cot. There's no overhead hanging projections. There's no bumpers, there's no pillows, there's no quilts in the bed. So, you know, everything is very safe for your baby. So I guess, tell me a little bit about the, the SIDS environment. What's their recommendations for bringing that little one home and popping it into bed? Well, you know, let's start firstly with the air environment. Um, it's really important not to have smoke in your household. If you're, um, there's a, there's a lot of things on the, on, the SIDS, on the Red Nose site that will help you in this area, but if you've got a premature baby, you shouldn't be co-sleeping with your baby. Uh, if you are co-sleeping, there's lots of safe things that you should be doing, and it's really not okay just to have your baby propped up on your shoulder and going to sleep when you're exhausted, because incidences do happen, and that's why these uh, 
foundations are set up to keep your baby safe. So clean environment, um, make sure your room's tidy because you don't want to be falling over with your baby. Um, I actually did have that happen to me, fell over with my newborn, slipped on a slippery bit of water on the floor. And um, you think that you're going to save your baby, but believe me, when you slip, my baby just flew in the air and um, it's, it's not great. Maybe, well, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> these things happen and it's you know it's it's being yeah. able to compose yourself and that you are out there doing the best that you can do with this little one and especially when it's uncharted you've never been there before that's right you don't know what that future holds for you yeah and you know you have to feel it has to feel right to you it has to feel safe for you don't you know be sometimes you get into thinking that ways of uh, your family or your friends do things and if it doesn't feel right for you then don't do that and I guess we've got um, our little one here. Um, this is a, a doll for our display purposes only. So we haven't got a real baby just lying there. Yes. Um, what would be some of the things that we should be popping them into wear to bed? Well, you know, um, Elise, when I worked in um, neonatal care, we used to have mums bring in bag loads of lots of, you know, suits and things. And we'd always be rummaging through to find out all the ones that were the natural fibres, cottons, polycottons, bamboos. Because what happens is your baby doesn't know how to regulate their temperature very well. So be careful with what you put on your baby. Overdressing makes them hot and that can contribute to SIDS. So really nice um, natural fibres and making sure that everything fits well. Examining the clothing to make sure there's no loose threads because they can wrap around your baby's toes and fingers and potentially cause quite a lot of trouble. Shall we show the... Ladies and little people, how to do Yep, them. let's show our audience how to do a nice wrap for that little one. You know, because that's, I think, something which, you know, some hospitals will recommend, some won't. Yes, yep. I find that for unsettled babies, wrapping is a fabulous resource. And I have a lot of parents will say, my baby doesn't like to be wrapped. But often, um, you know, but your baby has an immature um, nerve the nervous system is immature, so often that jerking and, and pushing away is not that they don't like to be wrapped, it's just that they're immature. Even if your baby um, hasn't been wrapped for a, at all, just using it as a settling tool and then unwrapping your baby when they go to sleep is still considered okay by SIDS. So let me show you how we used to wrap our babies in the nursery, uh, arms on their chest. This is how your baby sleeps in utero, so we try to copy that folding one side over, making sure your baby's face is clear of any blankets, no hats, and tuck in, as you saw, we just tuck in that behind his back. He's a very good baby, by the way. <laughs> Aren't you, Gary? This is, our, this is our perfect baby. Is it Gary? <laughs> oh, I think it is. <laughs> Little Gary today. Yeah. So don't um, have your baby wrapped so tightly that you're restricting their airway and make sure that they have plenty of loose space around their hips because that can affect the way their, their joints are. So wrapping baby nicely, just firmly but not too tight. And now he's ready to go into the cot. And making sure your baby's up the end of the cot so that they can't, beg your pardon, and away you go Gary, so that he can't slide under any blankets that might be covering him and remembering that this is a safe way to, to sleep your baby. And will we be raising the side of this cot as well because we've got it up in that higher position? Look, for little babies like this, it's fine to have the cot down. When your baby starts to becoming more active and, and really that as you progress and you no longer wrap your baby when they start rolling, you will find that um, for safety you will put the cot side up. Wonderful. So I guess how could I tell, as a, as a new parent, how could I tell if maybe little baby is, is overheating a little bit? So one of the ways of telling if your baby is overheating, I'll just pick him up again, is if you put your hands down here, down into his clothing and feel his chest, if it just feels nice and warm, then your baby's... Um, would be fairly comfortable. It's normal for babies to have cold, thing, cold toes and fingers and hands. So um, 
providing your baby's not sweating around the back of the neck and around the face, then your baby's pretty comfortable. Okay. So what would sort of be the temperature I would have my nursery at for the little one? So having a room around 17 to 22 degrees is the optimum sleeping temperature for everybody, for you know the, the grown-ups as well. So they say that you really you don't need to have your, your room heated. We're coming into winter and a lot of parents are concerned about having their rooms at the right temperature. But as, as long as you've got your baby dressed appropriately for winter, not too many blankets, really one blanket is considered okay, and the suit that you've, you've got your baby in is warm enough. Okay, so what would therefore, we're, we're talking about sleep, what would be some of the cues that I would look for as a parent to know when to put my baby down? That's a great question, Elise. I, I really love this question. One of the things that parents find is, um, I find that is they miss the sleep, the really early sleep cues. Um, what happens when that happens is your baby starts uh, having a stress response and you have certain hormones that come into play which make settling take so much longer. So one of the early signs, I just have to pick him up, I'm coming up myself now. One of those early signs is that if you're engaging with your baby, he might be smiling at you, looking at you, looking intently at your face, he'll suddenly become quite starey eyed glassy, in, his eyes will look glassy and he'll look right through you. That is a very early sleep sign, a tired sign. Another thing is your baby might become quite twitchy, uh, they might go pale in complexion, they might start clenching their little fists um, and crying really is a late sign so uh, try and act before you get to that point. So with little baby Gary, should I be thinking that I would want to pop him down before he's at that point, so while they're calm and relaxed? You know, one of the things, this is really one of the secrets, is that if you act before your baby's got to that stress point, um, you have much more success of getting your baby to go to sleep when they're awake. And I find that this is the ideal time to start with um, music. So that's what I would be instructing parents to do, to start playing music at the time that they put their, their baby into the cot. Um, before he's become, you know, distressed yep. because, you know, that just makes your life so much harder. So as a new parent, when should I start thinking about getting the routine, that sleep routine into place? Yeah, look, you know, this is a really common question that I get and I always find that you don't need a routine when you bring your baby home from hospital. This is a time when, you know, you've got a new little person, you're getting to know your baby, he's getting to know you. It's really, a, it's such a special time. And you know, if you introduce a, a routine too early, then you're kind of setting up all these rules for yourself and you become disappointed when things don't go quite right. It's such a changing time. So just go with the flow, get to know your baby, get as much help as you can. And I think that's a big thing that you've mentioned, Deb, is, is don't set those expectations up there so high yes. that with this little one who doesn't know what your expectations are and can't work towards them, you know, just go with that flow and, and relax and enjoy that time. Yeah, most definitely. And, you know, parents will then say, well, when should I start a routine? And, you know, if you've got your new baby, usually you can go anywhere. Well, you could go anywhere, but at the moment you're all stuck at home. But, you know, you can take them anywhere and they feed and sleep and generally they're pretty easy going. But when they get to that point where you know, they don't settle easily and you might be out somewhere and they start crying and you can't, you know, settle them. And it's kind of around that six weeks for, for a lot of babies. That's when you have to start thinking about a routine. So making sure that when you know it's your baby's time to have their, their naps or their, their sleeps, that um, you're in their environment that is familiar to them and usually that's at home. So I guess what about, you know, often they talk about bathing. When would be the right time to bathe that little one in order to promote that sleep? Some babies find having a bath before their naps quite calming, but other babies find that unwrapping and being naked uh, actually hypes them up because babies generally don't like to feel cold. Um, it's perfectly fine. You don't have to bath your baby every day. In fact, it's probably better for your baby's skin that you don't bath your baby every day. And, you know, if, if you have a baby that is quite sensitive, bath your baby earlier in the day so that when it comes time to sleep, because that window can be really tiny. When you see those sleep signs, you might only have two minutes before you suddenly have a baby that's upset and crying because you've missed that window. 
So keep your routine really short. I always say short and sweet. Wow, two minute window is not big there to be picking up on those cues that you've been teaching us. No. So I guess when we are putting that little one to bed, should I be starting to read that book to them like I would with that older toddler? Reading is great, but again, if your baby's tired, it's, uh, it's your job to settle your baby and get them sleeping, not to be uh, reading to them and prolonging that sleep time. And so I guess you've spoken about that music. So that music is something to help calm that little one. Tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, you know, they did some studies where they, uh, they've looked at talking to your baby, um, reading to your baby and singing a lullaby to your baby. And what they found was that music component helped you help baby settle up to 90 minutes longer than the other two options, which is pretty amazing. And it's because it has, music has a dopamine effect. So what that is, is it's a, a, it's a hormone that comes into play that makes your baby feel good. And there's only a few things that do that. And fortunately, music is one of them. Well, that's fantastic. Mm. And I think that's that little you know, tidbit there just to, to find that song that you can sing with them that you're comfortable doing. Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess if we've got children of different ages, which a lot of us do, how would I settle all of them at night time, you know, to make it as easy as possible for me and for those children? Yes, good question. Um, because I'm use, playing music therapy, uh, there are quite a few little tips you can do. Firstly, you put child that's the calmest to bed first. Because as I explained before, that hormone effect, you know, where the cortisol's going, and then the adrenaline kicks in, and then your, your baby or your toddler's literally climbing, well, not literally, but almost climbing the walls, which I'm sure you know. Yeah. Um, you, you really want to avoid that. So put your calmest child to sleep first, and then that's one out of the way, and then work on the others. Okay, so you spoke a little bit there about play therapy. Um, so I guess, can you expand on that a little bit for me? Yeah, look, what I find is um, the behaviour that goes on before sleep is really important. It is that interaction between parent and child is absolutely crucial to get right. Because if the parent starts feeling stressed, the child starts feeling stressed. Uh, I, I have a, a play therapy there that I always think is it's quite funny because parents will say to me, my child hates this bear, it won't have anything to do with this bear. And you know, the job of the toddler is to turn the parent's thinking around so that the toddler's in charge and the parent isn't. So what I instruct the parent to do is they play the therapy, the play therapy component, and they let their toddler have a tantrum or whatever they're doing, it's, it's fine. And you'll usually find that toddlers will come around because you know toddlers have to be in the action and it, it works a treat, it's amazing. Oh, fantastic. It's those little tidbits that we need to hear to help us get through these years with this little one. So I guess also some people raise about concerns for, for teething and what we can do to try and help that little one teething when they often say that it disrupts their sleep. Yes, look, it's, babies have mental leaps every month in the first six months, plus physical leaps. So they're going from transitioning from um, bassinets to cots and uh, wrapping to unwrapping, all those transitions, sitting up, rolling. One of the things that parents will say to me is, their child doesn't sleep because they're teething. And usually they've gone through a whole lot of things. They might have some great products out there for, um, for, for babies to chew on during the day. Um, some of those things that you can put in the fridge or you know, cool gels that help calm down hot you know, tops, yeah. hot sore gums. Um, but I've found that you know, if you're giving your baby analgesics and they're still displaying signs of teething, then teething's not the problem. So work on all those teething things during the day. When your baby's awake, giving them lots of chewy things, even a frozen face washer you can hold in their mouth and they can have a chew on that um, to help soothe their sore gums. And um, the sleep is a different problem. So address that. It's not the same. It's not the same thing. So they're separate in a sense. They're separate, try. yes, most definitely. Now I guess, have we got any questions out there, Nat? We do have a few. So Paula on Instagram um, has asked how she can get her daughter to sleep longer during the day. Um, she's six months old and is having three sleeps. 
three sleeps. Three sleeps throughout the day. Okay. So I'm, I'm assuming that the, the naps are relatively short. short. Yeah. One of the things um, that happens when your baby, in fact, when anybody's not getting enough sleep, um, and I refer to as sleep debt, is that you sleep shorter, you, so you wake more frequently, it's harder to settle and you wake too early. So addressing those issues where you can help your baby be calmer is one way of helping them extend their sleep. And often I find when I work with parents, two things either happen, night times improve and then days, sometimes day sleeps improve and then nights. So um, you know, helping to get your baby to settle faster will be one of those ways to help uh, get that sorted out. Uh, Lauren on Instagram has asked how you can safely sleep, uh, safely sleep newborn twins. Okay, yeah, well, babies shouldn't be slept in the same bed, so you should have two, uh, two separate sleep spaces. And again, routine is going to be something that you're trying to feed your babies together so that they're sleeping at the same time. And being aware that you know you're always conforming to uh, the red nose rules, so pop online and read up about that because there's a lot of information there. Far too much for me to go into here today. Okay, Crystal on Facebook has said that her six-week-old son won't sleep for any longer than thirty to forty-five minutes during the day. Do you have any recommendations on how to get him to sleep longer? Firstly, I would suggest uh, you wrap wrap him if if you're not doing that. Um, again, arms over chest is uh, one of the, the ways babies sleep in utero, so they're used to sleeping like that. Um, I have great success with the music component that I've got that helps babies be calmer. So act really quickly when you see his sleep signs and um, get him settled because the longer you uh, delay that, if you miss those signs, the harder it is for him to settle. So it's a symptom of sleep debt. Natasha on Instagram has asked how, how should she um, dress her newborn when sleeping in winter? Okay, so you can, you can, there's some great products that you've got here. I know that conform to safe sleep, your um, grow bags, etc. that have got nice uh, fitted necks and fitted arms that uh, you don't want any loose garments. If you, uh, if you come into the store and get a TOG rating on that so you'll match up the, the room temperature with the actual garment, you can uh, help your baby to be sleeping in the right temperature so they're not going to be overheated or too cold. A lot of parents get very stressed about the temperature but you know, basically if your baby feels warm, they're okay. And there are lots of, so jump online and you can have a look at the different sorts of swaddles. So they do have the TOG rating, so a 2.5 or a 3.5 TOG for those cooler months as we're going into winter. They even provide some guidance on what to wear underneath. Yes. But we'd still recommend is just check their core temperature. You know, so what might be said where this little suit with this little singlet and this TOG rating little sleep suit, you might still find that your child might be slightly warmer. So if you test it and you feel that it is a little bit clammy on their core, or even that sort of sweating on the back of their neck, yeah. it means that you need to take off that layer. Yeah, and, and taking off under layers. So uh, even if you think your baby's cold, best not to apply lots of blankets because that, that doesn't, you know, that's not a safe way to sleep your baby, just a light blanket on top. And um, really building up layers from within your, your, your sleep garment. Yeah. Okay, Matho on Instagram has asked if there's a difference between swaddling or using, swaddling, wrapping, or using a sleeping bag for a newborn? Look, it's personal preference what you, what you do. Um, traditionally, we've swaddled our babies because that was the way they, they felt safest. Um, even, I recommended parents that have children much, much older, if they wrap them at that settling stage, it really helps them to feel safe and secure and calm and then take it off them when they go to sleep. So I would highly, I, you know, I'm a big fan of wrapping um, in those uh, early stages. And I think you've shown us how to wrap with those arms across. Some yeah. of them will actually sleep in the little swaddles with different arm positions for that little one. Yes. Diana on Facebook has asked, do you need to use a blanket on top of a sleeping bag? 
You can use a blanket on top, just be aware that you know, you're checking your baby's temperature and have your blanket tucked in at the side so nothing flapping around that could uh, cover your baby's face because that's the most important thing that you don't want happening. No quilts or anything, um, doona, fluffy soft things. And I think a lot of the sleeping bags now are weight rated so they're quite thick that you wouldn't need to put anything no. on top because that becomes their actual man chest of them. So when it's like a little wrap like this, it doesn't have that weight rating to it. No. And then you'd have your little tight blanket tucking them underneath. Yes, that, that's right. I mean, there's a lot of science that's gone into, you know, all of the, the garments and the, the temperature. So that, that's a great thing that we, we love things that have been researched and, uh, you know, the company shows that the companies are doing the right mm. thing. And I think it does help those parents where, you know, you, you don't know what, you know, what am I meant to dress them in? What am I meant to put these in? The weight rating of the blankets over the top where they've done it all for you. Oh, I think they've, yes. they've yes. done it, you pop them in there, you still test their core and you know, okay, they're safe in that environment. Pop them in my cot, you know, with that slightly older child, pop it up and they can yes. wriggle around and they stay warm in that little suit no matter where they are, but they've not got that trance of entrapment at all. No, there. that's right. Now, Katie on Instagram says that her newborn, who is three weeks old, hates being wrapped, so sleeps with their arms out. Um, does it matter that um, the hands are cold if the body is warm? It doesn't matter if the hands are cold. Hands and feet, cold, cold hands and feet is uh, normal. It's the core temperature that you need to worry about. But remember that I said before that sometimes that uh, your perception of the, your baby hating to be wrapped is um, because of the immature uh, a neurovascular system so that their, their nervous system is very sensitive they've got they've got the moro reflex which you know the startle reflex so all of those things can make it look like your baby doesn't like being wrapped but you know i suggest give it a try but, you know you can only try okay crystal on instagram wants to know if you have any t tips on how she can teach her son to self-settle himself back to sleep well, yes, this is, a, this is our dream thing that we love our babies to self-settle and you know, it kind of depends on his age too because you know, our expectation is we bring our babies home and you put them in the cot and they self-settle. I have to say I use a music component for self-settling because it's just an amazing tool to help your baby be calm and relaxed and really that's what it's all about, having your baby calm so that they can fall into a, a state of relaxation and self-settle. And I think that music playing in that background, it's that environment for them. They know that they're safe. They know that, you know, they've been popped in here by someone who loves them yes. and then it just does allow them to relax again. Yes, and being, you know, being very consistent with what you're doing because the more times you change, um, you know, you don't want to be sleeping on the couch one night with your baby. It's it's not safe at all, but all those changes mean that um, it's, it's much harder for your baby to know the expectation of going to sleep. Yeah. Now, Deb, you've referenced um, music quite a bit throughout um, this presentation. and We've had a few questions asking where people can, can get that music. Are you able to respond to that? Uh, yes, um, the music's available at... Do you want to... We can pop the link in the oh, comments. But yep, at 9i.com.au. And it's available as a digital download, so it's uh, very user friendly. And Diana has asked um, We're in the process of transitioning our son from bassinet to cot. We sometimes wrap, uh, rock the bassinet to help him settle, and then he falls asleep independently. Any tips on how we can settle him in the cot? Uh, begin your settling in the cot and then, um, you know, give him some time, give him some space to allow himself to settle. Often babies will go through a whole lot of wriggling and, you know, groaning and moaning and that's kind of, it's like, you know, your cat when it does that thing on the cushion. <laughs> it's, um, it's okay, let them, let them have a little bit of space to do that and if they become distressed then pick up your baby. And, you know, I always say, you know, make eye contact with your baby, talk to your baby, it's all fine, you know, it's a human. It's where your baby's designed to, for you to be interacting with them. And then, you know, when your baby's calm, put them back in and, and start again. 
And Jenny has commented that her eight-week-old son wakes at 4 a.m. She feeds him, and but then it becomes difficult to settle back in his cot, and she sometimes falls asleep with him in the chair. Um, do you have any tips on what she could do to help him sleep in those early hours, getting him to resettle? Just make sure that your baby hasn't got um, wind, that you're burping him properly, because um, certainly that will affect his comfort. Um, Again, you know, try and be calm about the whole thing because, you know, it's a terrible time in the morning. But it, it is also an expectation that your baby is going to wake up and need you and want you to help him feel secure. So, you know, I, I think, you know, sometimes we expect our baby should be doing things that really you, you may be asking for a little bit too much. But, you know, helping your baby be calm and teaching him that you're there and you love him and you support him. Um, is so much better than being anxious because that's not going to help any situation. And our final question for the night is about sleep cycles. Um, so is it natural for a baby to wake after 45 minutes and need resettling? Absolutely. 45 minutes is around the average sleep cycle for a baby. Um, babies have to learn to string their sleep cycles together. So if your baby can't do that, they need a little bit of assistance from you to do that. So that's all very normal for babies to be um, having, having to learn that. Again, if it's during the day, if your baby's over eight weeks old, have your room dark, nice dark environment will help him to produce melatonin, which is the sleepy hormone. So all those little things will help. So I guess, Deb, is there any little, you know, take home bit that we can give our viewers tonight to try and help them with their settling and their sleep routine? Um, from the expert that you are that I wish I'd had 21 years ago with me but you know it's something that we can give our audience tonight to help them with this next journey in their life. I think um, the take home tip is to uh, look out for those early sleep signs you know those tired signs and try and act really quickly on them because when your baby or your toddler becomes distressed that is your worst enemy and that's going to make settling harder and then they go into the you know, less, they're getting less over, overall sleep and um, more waking during the night. So, yeah, watch for those early cues. So I wanted to thank everybody for joining us tonight and thank you, Deb, for coming and My being pleasure. here with Baby Bunting in our live series. And so everyone, please have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much and we'll see you again at our next live series. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.